Okay, this is fragment six. Uh, what is modern science? Francis Bacon and the transformation of European thought. In this video, I will reference Francis Bacon's New Organon as translated by Jonathan Bennett. The link to Bennett's translation can be found in the description. In the first fragment on this channel, I looked at Martin Heidegger's concept of technicity that he mentioned in his Spiegel interview. It might be helpful now to look at where this global movement that he describes, and which our world, one might say, is in the grips of, came from. We're going to look at a 1620 work by English author Francis Bacon for a glimpse at the revolution in thought that took place in that period. Many people look at Bacon's contemporaries, people like Galileo and Rene Descartes, for signs of the revolution in thought. And really, neither Bacon nor Galileo nor Descartes even are really the fundamental origins of modern science, but they are collectively part of that transition, something that is taking place in this period. But I want to look at Bacon particularly for two reasons. One, out of all the moderns, including Descartes, he is the most explicit in his opposition to the ancients and the most insistent upon the need for something new, not just a new philosophical sect, but a new way of thinking entirely, something quite radical. And because he is so open and so insistent, we can actually see in him the transition from old to new. Whereas in Descartes, we find the new way of thinking, as it were, ready-made and ongoing. And the second reason is that Bacon, perhaps because of his political career, he was Attorney General and Lord High Chancellor of England, he's acutely aware of social and religious implications of the new science that is coming into being. In looking at these fragments from Bacon's work, it should be kept in mind that he is attempting to persuade men to take up the new science and accept a new way of thinking. So there is an element of rhetoric and persuasive language in his writing that's different from what you will find in strictly scientific or philosophical works written by his contemporaries. The fragments in this video come from a work he called The New Organon. Now right away, an explicit challenge to the ancients is apparent because Organon is the usual title given to a collection of works by Aristotle on logic. So to write about a new Organon really does mean a new way of logic or a new way of thinking. And this work, Bacon himself describes as part of a larger six-part work called the Instauratio Magna, meaning the Great Fresh Start. Let's take a look at how Bacon conceives of this fresh start, how it differs from the philosophy which was accepted in his own time, and how he attempts to persuade others to take up the mantle. The work as a whole is presented as a collection of aphorisms. He calls them aphorisms, although some of them run on for several pages. And in this, he seems to be following an approach which he later says the earliest seekers after truth followed. From the outset, Bacon presents modern science, that is, the process of inductive reasoning based on rational, empirical inquiry and controlled experimentation as something which must lie between the extremes of certainty and doubt. So science is something that must steer a middle course between believing too much that we have the answers, we know what we need to know. One example of this is Aristotle, but another example he very clearly implies is uh, religious dogma. And that's one side. The other side is too much doubt. So modern science also is uh, not a process of it being incredibly doubtful because it is going to be building up a progressive sense of certainty about things. In the preface, he says, those who have taken it on themselves to lay down the law of nature as something that has already been discovered and understood, whether they have spoken in simple confidence or in a spirit of professional posturing, have done great harm to philosophy and the sciences, as well as succeeding in producing beliefs in people, they have been effective in squashing and stopping inquiry. And the harm they have done by spoiling and putting an end to other men's efforts outweighs any good their own efforts have brought. Some people, on the other hand, have gone the opposite way, asserting that absolutely nothing can be known. Now, the scientific method he presents, which is not all that different from the one practiced today, he calls hard to practice but easy to explain. 
It is a method of progressively increasing certainty based on sense perception guided along a certain path. Existing science fails to progress. It does not develop. For Bacon, this is unacceptable. We should be increasing not only our knowledge of nature, but our power to manipulate it. And the fact that neither seems to be happening in 1620 indicates that we are doing the work of the mind incorrectly. And to quote from Bacon, we are left with only one way to health, namely to start the work of the mind all over again. In this, the mind shouldn't be left to its own devices, but right from the outset should be guided at every step as though a machine were in control. This last line is crucial because it is critical to the way modern thought works, and it hints at the effects of the world of technicity, which Heidegger described. The methods of science and technology are rigorous, and they have a kind of inhuman quality to them. Power is gained by following along a rigidly defined track. And this has been so successful, and we are so trained in it, that in all things, it does seem that a machine is in control. I once heard a scientist suggest that, aside from introducing new concepts or interpreting data in a new way, many scientific experiments could just be proposed and conducted artificially by algorithm. In other words, that science could proceed to a surprisingly large degree without much intervention from human scientists as though a machine were in control indeed. From the outset, Bacon makes clear that modern science is about bringing knowledge and power closer together than has ever been done. Aphorism 3 reads, human knowledge and human power meet at a point, for where the cause isn't known, the effect can't be produced. The only way to command nature is to obey it, and something that functions as the cause in thinking about a process functions as the rule in the process itself. Knowledge is power is a phrase that Bacon used, not here, but in his meditations. But the inventor of the saying as we know it now was actually Bacon's secretary, the philosopher Thomas Hobbes. Modern science is not a direct outgrowth of anything the Greeks did. Although Bacon says we owe much of what we know and think to Greek philosophers and investigators of nature, in Aphorism 31, he notes that we have to make a radical break with the past. It is pointless to expect any great advances in science from grafting new things onto old. If we don't want to go around in circles forever, making progress that is so small as to be almost negligible, we must make a fresh start with deep foundations. And if you look at the origin of modern physics, it's not in Aristotle's work called physics. If anything, it's in Newton's Principia Mathematica. Modern medicine, similarly, does not begin with Galen, and so on with other sciences and arts today. They originate in this modern approach, not the ancient approach. Note that Bacon is again insistent upon the need for advancement. A key problem with the received science in Bacon's time is that it allows for bias to corrupt our understanding of nature. Now, I once heard a scientist say, what the scientific method is for is it's a method of eliminating all possible bias. And I thought that was a great way of describing it. And actually, that's sort of in keeping with the spirit of what Bacon says. So Bacon very famously identifies four categories of bias, which he refers to as idols. He's rather famous for his idols, so it's worth listing them here for your reference. He talks about idols of the tribe, meaning uh, false notions and biases that arise out of human nature. Idols of the cave, meaning false notions or biases peculiar to each individual person. Idols of the marketplace, which are false notions or biases arising due to language and terminology. And then last, idols of the theater, meaning false notions or biases that come from the received systems of thought, such as Aristotle's philosophy. An example of an idol of the tribe is calling fire an element because, as Bacon puts it, it suits the human mind to think of the four elements of earth, air, fire, and water. It completes the square. It seems like a nice uh, uh, balanced way of looking at the world around us. It's composed of these four different things, and these are the elements of the world. But the problem is 
uh, if you compare that with the modern view of those things, fire stands out, and Bacon is very well aware that it stands out. So earth, fire, uh, the earth, air, and water, they're not elements directly, but they are composed of elements. So air is composed of nitrogen and oxygen and other gases, and water is, of course, composed of uh, two molecules of hydrogen, one molecule of oxygen, and then earth is uh, composed of various, uh, you know, uh, various elements like silicon and gold and platinum and all the, you know, all the things that you find in, in, the, in the world, all the things that stuff is made of, that makes up earth. But fire is not an element like those others. And Bacon was aware of that as well. And in fact, he points out that uh, fire is an example of it's a, it's a, we think of it as an, an element like the others, but it's not. It's something different. And we have to understand what fire actually is before we can manipulate it properly. So the modern take on it is that fire isn't an element. It's a visible process of combustion involving gases. Now, once you understand that, you could invent something like a methane grill, where methane gas, i.e. natural gas, is used to cook because from the modern perspective, you understand that fire is something that combines a fuel, oxygen in the atmosphere and heat. And if you add heat in a controlled way to a fuel source with oxygen in the environment, you could actually get a controlled flame to cook with. So gas grills are a visible product of a change in thinking about the world and thinking about fire. They're an example of what Bacon predicted would happen if a revolution in, the, in thought occurred. Modern science involves a different relation to nature. It is something to be cut into and investigated minutely in a way that was never really done before. Aphorism 51. But better than abstracting from nature is dissecting it, which is what Democritus, Democritus is a, a pre-Socratic philosopher who had a theory about the world being made of matter, uh, being made of atoms. So which Democritus and his followers did, getting deeper into nature than anyone since. What we should be attending to is matter, its microstructures and changes of microstructure and actus purus and the, act, the laws of action or motion. The alternative to studying matter is to study forms, but forms are fabrications of the human mind, unless you want to call the laws of action forms. Now, this is an example of a place where Bacon is transitioning from old way of thinking to new. The old way of thinking is to think in terms of mental categories, what he calls forms. So you would have something like the form of a lion, which is a collection of qualities by which the individual things that we call lions can be identified as such. No individual lion is that form. The form is a category, it's an abstraction from the individual cases. But Bacon is saying that that's not how real investigation of nature proceeds, not by these mental categories of, of uh, dividing things up, of, de of defining things with words. What we need to do is we need to understand what are the laws of action that say how matter moves. And an example of this would be Newton's first law. That is a law of action as Bacon understands it. Now, Newton came along much later, by the way, so Bacon, in his work, is describing things that will come into being later. He isn't describing things that exist in his own time. It's part of his genius, really, is that he's describing what would come later will look like. He's sort of saying it's going to have to look something more like this, and that is what it later looked like. Newton's first law is abstract, but it's different in the way that an Aristotelian form of talking about something like motion in itself or a lion or the color white would be. Bacon's idols of the marketplace are an exa interesting example where we notice that the modern mind has a suspicion of language. There's, a, there's an incredible suspicion of language in the scientific way of thinking about things. And Bacon says that men think that reason governs words, but as he puts it in Aphorism 49, words have a power of their own that reacts back onto the intellect. We cannot understand natural and material things through words and definitions. 
because definitions consist of words which beget other words. Now, Bacon didn't have the answer to this problem, but the answer to this problem becomes that modern science adopts mathematics as the language of science. Now compare Newton's preface to his Principia, in which the modern science revolution had already taken place. Uh, so here's, here's, how Newton, here's what Newton says. Since the ancients made great account of the science of mechanics in the investigation of natural things, and the moderns, laying aside substantial forms and occult qualities, have endeavored to subject the phenomena of nature to the laws of mathematics, I have in this treatise cultivated mathematics so far as it regards philosophy. Now, philosophy here means natural philosophy, i.e. natural science. The mathematical re revolution has taken place. Take a look at uh, Bacon's discussion of the idols of the theater, the false notions that arise due to received systems of thought. This is interesting, aphorism 62. He says, there are many idols of the theater or idols of theories, and there can be and perhaps will be many more. For a long time now, two factors have militated against the formation of new theories in philosophy and science. One, men's mind, uh, the first is, men's minds have been busied with religion and theology. And the second one is, civil governments, especially monarchies, have been hostile to anything new, even in theoretical matters, so that men have done that sort of work at their own peril and at great financial cost to themselves, not only unrewarded, but exposed to contempt and envy. First of all, the focus on religion to the detriment of science is a complaint by now familiar to all of us. But I find it interesting that Bacon regards monarchical governments as also hostile to the development of science due to a general suspicion towards innovation. So could it be that uh, systems like a monarchy or an aristocracy, since they place such a premium on stability, could such regimes be naturally a little bit hostile to innovations, including scientific innovations? Has there been a regime that was deeply conservative in the original sense, meaning a, a non-democratic regime, let's say, and also followed scientific innovation? What would an example of that be? Uh, and what would it look like in practice? That'd be an interesting question. And it's also worth noting that liberalism, or the theory of uh, liberal democracy, when it came around, it embraced scientific innovation very specifically, and this might have been the source of some of its early strength, that it embraced this. In fact, liberalism as a philosophy addresses both of the problems that Bacon identifies here in Aphorism 62. First of all, it removed considerations of religion and theology from the table by focusing on government to be a management of disagreements among people rather than resolving disputes about first principles. Disputes about first principles, i.e. religious disputes, were put off. Those questions were not asked. Under liberalism, they're ignored. And then the second way is um, liberalism embraced uh, innovation. If you want to look at an example of this, notice that in the U.S. Constitution, uh, the, the element of the Constitution which allows for um, patents and things like that is specifically set up uh, with the idea that it's beneficial to encourage scientific and technical innovation. Also, it's interesting that Bacon is suggesting that the advance of science could be an innovation, an innovation not unlike or not unrelated to a political innovation. Uh, later, he will claim that it's not, but let's look at what happens when we get there. So modern thinking, unlike ancient thinking, insists upon progress and increase rather than stability. Aphorism 74, the growth and progress of systems and sciences provides signs as to their value. Something that is grounded in nature grows and increases, while what is based on opinion alters but doesn't grow. There's an inherent bias towards progressivism in modern thinking. Modern thinking tends towards a privileging of the most recent as a line of development that has reached an apex. It's not a conception of standing on the shoulders of giants, but of being at the end of a sequence. 
as Bacon puts it in Aphorism 84, men have been kept back from making progress in the sciences as though by a magic spell, by their reverence for antiquity, by the authority of men of high standing in philosophy, and then by the general acceptance of certain propositions. I've spoken of the last of these above. As for antiquity, the opinion that men have about it is a lazy one that does violence to the meaning of the word. For really, what is antique is the world in its old age. That is the world now. And the earlier age of the world, when the ancients lived, though in relation to us it was the elder, in relation to the world it was the younger. We expect an old man to know more about the human condition than a young man does, and to make more mature judgments about it because of his experience and the number and variety of things he has seen, heard, and thought about. In the same way, more can be fairly expected from our age if only we knew and chose to employ its strength than from ancient times because ours is a more advanced age of the world and has accumulated countless experiments and observations. That is indeed how progressives today see themselves as regards the ancients. We know more. We have seen more. We don't need to read these old texts because we have more knowledge. Now, Bacon is also quite clear that religion is a great adversary of the advancement of learning. Notice how he delicately presents this in Aphorism 89. Bear in mind also that in every period, natural philosophy has had a troublesome and recalcitrant adversary in superstition and blind religious extremism. Among the Greeks, those who first proposed natural causes for lightning and for storms were condemned for disrespect towards the gods, and some of the fathers of the early Christian church were not much milder in their attitude to those who, on most convincing grounds that no sane person would question today, maintain that the earth is round and thus that the antipodes exist. Even today, it is harder and more dangerous than it ought to be to talk about nature because of the procedures of the theological schoolmen. His turn to that modern example of the theological schoolmen, meaning Catholic followers of Aristotle, would be a safe enough attack to make in Protestant England. And he uses the qualification of blind religious extremism uh, to suggest that, no, 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 the problem is being too extremist being too blind. It's not religion itself, uh, although what qualifies as blind extremism, um, he doesn't exactly go into too much detail on. So this idea of religion, superstition, extremism being a potential adversary to advancement of sciences is a serious matter to which Bacon recurs several times in this work and in others of his works, suggesting a very deep and penetrating awareness of a delicate situation. So he makes a use of a distinction in uh, this aphorism. Natural philosophy deserves its place as religion's most faithful handmaid. Religion displays God's will, while natural philosophy displays his power. Now compare that to what he says later about what religion does and what natural philosophy does. So it's a little bit different when he words it later. But just here we'll, su we'll say that Prior to this aphorism, Bacon has suggested that in natural philosophy, knowledge and power meet, and that the purpose of scientific advance is to increase man's power over nature. So a natural implication of that seems to be that natural philosophy not only displays God's power, but in a way puts that power into the hands of men. And if you consider our capacity to split the atom or manipulate the human genome, it seems that it has indeed given us that power, or at least a lot more of it than previously could be imagined. Bacon is also aware that advancements in learning are transformative. I often see contemporary people say things like, people back then couldn't imagine a world in which we blah, 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 some recent technical development such as social media. They couldn't imagine it, so they couldn't you know, plan for it, or whatever they have to say about things can be discounted. But I think it's interesting that Bacon shows that people in his time, at least he was, very well aware that technical developments could arise for which there would be no modern analog. He gives the example of gunpowder in Aphorism 109. Suppose that before gunpowder was invented, someone described it in terms of its effects. 
there is a new invention by means of which the strongest towers and walls can be demolished from a long way off. That would no doubt have set men thinking about how to increase the power of catapults and wheeled ramming devices. The notion of a fiery blast suddenly and forcefully expanding and exploding would hardly have entered in any man's mind or imagination, because nothing closely analogous to that had ever been seen. Well, except perhaps in earthquakes and lightning, but they wouldn't have been seen as relevant because they but they would they wouldn't have been seen as relevant because they are mighty works of nature which men couldn't imitate. So science, as Bacon conceives of it, is something that will actively seek to bring such mighty works of nature within the compass of man's power. And it has done that. Aphorism 129 is quite significant. Modern thinking is something global and universal rather than particular. There's something about modern thought that wants to break out of a merely local area or a merely national way of thinking. And Bacon is insistent upon that because scientific discoveries, he says that they're nobler, they're more important. They extend to the whole of mankind and are thus superior to merely civil benefits, which apply only to a particular place and don't last long. Einstein is more of a hero than Eisenhower. This idea that something can benefit mankind is, outside of religion, rather a new idea. Earlier, Bacon had suggested that monarchies were hostile to innovations. Now he suggests that scientific developments are different from political innovations. So I said earlier that he said, uh, earlier I suggested there was a connection between a scientific innovation and a political innovation. Here, in 129, he tries to distinguish them, say they're different because scientific developments are entirely benign. Here's what he says. Also, improvements in civil matters usually bring violence and confusion with them, whereas scientific discoveries bring delight and confer benefits without causing harm or sorrow to anyone. This is just a rhetorical move here. Compare our earlier aphorism about the invention of gunpowder. Gunpowder was a scientific discovery. A little bit later, he'll in fact mention it as one of three momentous discoveries. But did the invention of gunpowder bring delight and confer benefits without causing harm or sorrow? It certainly did. And that suggests that the distinction by which Bacon wants to suggest that scientific innovations are different from political innovations is not correct. If that distinction fails, then scientific innovations are like political innovations, and potentially as dangerous, if anything, even more so because, remember, they are global. They extend to the whole of mankind. Bacon might have been aware and have been disguising his awareness, because again, remember, he's trying to get people to get on board with the system, but he might have been aware that the scientific revolution that he is going to promote is something that could bring innovations that would convulse all of mankind not just a country. It's even bigger than a political innovation. If anything, that's the distinction. The distinction being that it's everybody is implied. Everybody was convulsed by the development of gunpowder, not just Europe or not just one country in Europe. So Bacon goes on to write, notice the vigor of discoveries, their power to generate consequences. This is nowhere more obvious than in three discoveries that the ancients didn't know and whose origins, all quite recent, were obscure and humdrum. I'm talking about the arts of printing, gunpowder, and the nautical compass. These three have changed the whole aspect and state of things throughout the world, the first in literature, the second in warfare, the third in navigation bringing about countless changes, so that there seems to have been no empire, no philosophical system, no star that has exerted greater power and influence in human affairs than these mechanical discoveries. Now, all three of his examples show that, again, causing harm and sorrow is almost inevitable for scientific innovation. Print printing was instrumental in religious controversy, which led to many deaths. The compass allowed the settling of the new world, of course, we know about consequences there. And then gunpowder transformed warfare. So again, Bacon seems to be trying to be persuasive, but I believe he was also aware that the science he is promoting is something of global and absolutely fundamental impact, enormously innovative and enormously transformative of human life.
Now, there's a difficulty that arises from this. And a, a normal difficulty would be, well, what are we going to do with this power? And he addresses that as well. So let's take a look at how he addresses it. Just let the human race get back the right over nature that God gave to it and give it scope. How it is put into practice will be governed by sound reason and true religion. So we will have great power, yes. The question is, how will it be put into practice? Bacon suggests that reason and religion are what we will have to guide us. But will we have that? Won't science transform those? If it does, does that mean that science is all we have? We'll leave that as a question for now. At the end of Aphorism 52 in Book 2, we get a very momentous look at or some further insight into this. My aim is to act like an honest and faithful guardian. When men's intellect has broken free and come of age, I shall put men's fortunes into their own hands. This is bound to lead to an improvement in the human condition and an increase in power over nature. Okay, so modern science will improve the human condition. It will increase our power over nature. That's what he promises. The dangers are, what will we do with the power we gain? Re as he said earlier, reason and religion will guide us. In Bacon's time, that seemed well enough, perhaps, but in our time, postmodernism has called reason itself into doubt. And as for religion, God is dead. In such a world, what will guide how we use our power? That is the problem that we confront now. Bacon has some final words on religion and science in this same aphorism. In the fall, as recorded in the book of Genesis, man underwent a loss of innocence and a weakening of his power over creation. Both of these losses can be to some extent made good even in this life, the former by religion and faith, the latter by arts and sciences. For the curse that God laid on Adam and Eve didn't make the creation a complete outlaw forever. The part of it that said, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, means that by various labors, not by disputations or empty magical ceremonies, man will in due course and to some extent compel the created world to provide him with bread, i.e. to serve the purposes of human life. So the great advantage of science, and this is the only time Bacon really suggests this in this way, uh, I think that for the fact that it's the only time does not mean it's not important. I believe that it's both important and radical and could only be said once. And basically what he's saying is we can ref we could repair the fall of man. Now to suggest that we can, even if it's just qualified by to some extent, to suggest that we can to some extent repair the fall of man in this life by our own power, that's almost as unchristian a sentiment as you can produce. Certainly heterodox at best, but I would say almost unchristian or anti-Christian. And to give an illustration, we'll just take John Milton's uh, Paradise Lost as, let's say, a statement of the more orthodox view of the fall. And Milton writes, of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree whose mortal taste brought death into the world and all our woe with loss of Eden, till one greater man restore us and regain the blissful seat, sing heavenly muse. The fall is caused by man's disobedience to God's will, and it brings all our woe with it, all of it. Bacon made a distinction. He says, oh, it, it, uh, all our woe is not in just one category. There's two kinds of woe. We lost innocence, and we didn't lose, but our power over creation was weakened. And then he says, innocence is restored through religion and faith. Power is restored by us, by our efforts. Um, and then Milton suggests that all that woe is restored. The, the seat of paradise is regained by the one greater man. That's Jesus, of course. That's what his poem is about. Well, what Bacon suggests is, I'll add this observation. If loss of innocence doesn't bother you that much, or if power over creation is as delightful as Bacon says it will be, what purpose do religion and faith really serve? Can science provide for people all of what religion promised? Can it provide any of what religion promised? These are open questions, but I think Bacon's description of the attitude of modern science here, and it's the attitude of 
Heidegger's technicity. It's precisely what he says here. Modern science is the attitude of compelling the created world to serve the purposes of human life. And if in modern science, power and knowledge meet in one, the power that this view of the world confers upon those who follow it will be impossible to resist. I'll leave you with that as food for thought.